Teaching Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Now that we understand the basics of queues and messages that are exchanged to queues, let's take a look at that client storage API that allows us to work with queues in .NET applications. The first thing we're going to need to work with any storage type in Azure is what's known as the cloud storage account object. Notice we get the cloud storage account object from the configuration setting and there's that data connection string configuration parameter that we saw configured in our service configuration and service definition file. Again, that might be in development, use development storage, or might be set up to use the account name, key, and endpoint if we're actually running in the cloud. We'll need this cloud, uh, cloud storage account object, whether we're working with queues, tables, or blobs. Once we've got the cloud storage account object, we'll need to create what's known as a cloud queue client here called queue service. With the queue service, or essentially a cloud queue client object, we're able to do things like give us a list of all the queues. Or if we know the name of a particular queue, we can get a reference to that particular queue with get queue reference and the actual queue name. With that, we've got a cloud queue object. With a cloud queue object, what can we do? Well, first off, we need to make sure that the actual queue has been created. So we can call create if not existent to make sure that the queue is actually existing in our storage account. And we can clear a queue of all its messages or actually physically delete a queue. Once we have a queue, we're going to want to put messages in that queue and get messages out of that queue. How do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is create an actual message, a cloud queue message. And again, a cloud queue message can hold either text or a byte array. In this case, it's got some simple text. To take that message and now put it into the queue, or what we call adding the message to the queue, we simply call in the queue and add our message. To get a message out of the queue, we call get message. Now we call get messages, the visibility of that message, in other words, its availability to a particular process is there by default for 30 seconds. Or we can set it up to take longer. We can set it up so that the message is available to us for two hours. So without doing anything else other than calling get message, we're making the message available to us for 30 seconds. If our process takes longer than 30 seconds, as we showed in our little animation, that message times out and is back in the queue. If we want, we can specify an actual time. We can call get message with a particular time span to say how long we'd like to reserve, if you will, that message. We can also call get messages to retrieve several messages off the queue at one time. Once we're done working or processing that message, before that timeout, we want to call delete message. That pops the message off the queue and makes it no longer available to any process. One convenient thing we might want to do is to peek at a message. Essentially, let's take a look at the contents of a message without actually getting it. In other words, without saying we're working on it and thereby invoking the start of the timeout. So this is handy when we're trying to determine how to handle a particular message, especially if we're doing some sort of conditionalization in our code. It says, well, if the message has this information, send it over here or work with it in this way. If the message has this data, send it over here or work with it in another way. So to peek at a message doesn't actually remove the message uh, from the queue, nor does it actually start the timeout on a get message type of process. It just allows us to take a look at the contents without actually having the message being consumed by us. We're able to call peak message to look at a particular message, the one at the top of the queue, or we can ask for, with peak messages, a certain number of messages from the queue. Now, one thing we're going to want to do with regard to building Azure applications and working with these queues is to have some sort of process, pull, and constantly checking for messages in a queue. There is no sort of, no sort of publish or subscribe type of mechanism as we might find in other messaging systems in Azure. So it's up to applications that are consuming messages to pull or constantly be looking for messages. 
So typically what we'll have is consumers of messages are set into some sort of infinite loop. And you want to make sure that your process is what we call idempotent. What does that mean? That because a message might be pulled off the queue with get message, but then eventually time out, we can have a situation whereby multiple processes might actually have grabbed the same message. And so we want to make sure that the activity of those processes working on that message is always going to be the same no matter how many times we process that message. So we want to make our application code idempotent with regard to dealing with those messages. One thing to consider as well is when we're dealing with messages, if we're always checking for messages, there might be certain times in the application running where there are lots of messages and thereby maybe we need to pull faster. And then during other times where we're off-peak operations, we might not see very many messages and thereby wasting lots of cycles checking for messages. So consider what we call a back-off polling approach when you put your application code that's excluding messages in an infinite loop. For example, on each empty poll, in other words, where you go to the queue and find that there are no messages, increase your interval by, say, two times. And when you go and you find that there is a message, set it up so that you're back to the original polling cycle. Let's look at how we might use queues inside of a Wendell's Azure application to do things like improve web performance, collect work for offline consumers, and to break up more complex processes. First, to improve web role performance. Say, for example, we've got some sort of shopping application. In this case, the website, the ASP website shown as a server. Clients might re make requests of the website to buy some sort of product. The web application might then put into a queue a message for processing of that order but then immediately be able to respond back to the client with an indication that your request, your order has been taken and will get back to you as soon as that order is fulfilled. Backend processes can pull the message from a queue, do the work they need to do, update inventories and what have you, and then ultimately send back a response to the client that says your order has been processed. How does this help? Well, clients are given, uh, given immediate feedback from our web roles whereby back-end maybe worker roles serve to actually do the business processing on the order without delaying the clients. How else might queues be used? Well, maybe we have certain sort of consumers, let's say maybe worker roles, that only wake up at a certain period of time. Then most of the time, the consumer, the worker role is offline. We can use a queue to essentially collect work, collect messages for a longer period of time so that when that particular uh, worker role, that consumer finally does wake up, they have a great deal of work to do, but for that period of time that they're awake. And then, once they're done processing, they can sleep again for a while, and the queue again collects up work that needs to be done for that process. This might be particularly useful where we've got some sort of external vendor uh, application. In other words, where we can't have constant communication with that third party, with that vendor, we'll collect work for it in a queue, and then ultimately when we do establish communication with that vendor, that third party, through the queue, we can send lots of jobs to that particular vendor. Let's look at a final use of queues. One to help break up a complex process into many states. Each state is essentially a mini process, each with a dedicated queue. So, for example, going back to our shopping paradigm, let's say that when orders come in, there's a big worker process that needs to verify customer information, take care of shipping, and then notify the customer that their product is on the way. We might set this up such that a website, say for example, a web role, as a producer, puts a message into a queue as a new order, whereby our big worker role takes that message off goes through the verify, ship, and notify process, and eventually tells the consumer that we've completed and the product's on the way. But there's several problems with this big worker process. We've got some tight integration now, tight coupling between verify, ship, and notify. Each of those processes is essentially have to all complete and complete successfully for us to get through this whole big worker process. If we have partial success, maybe verify works, but shipment doesn't, there's no way for us to essentially recover any of that verify work. So how can we start to break up this more complex problem into smaller state problems? 
We can do that through the use of message queues. Essentially, we'll build a dedicated queue for each one of these mini processes. And each one of the mini processes works with each of its queues to essentially take on the piece of the work and then put a new message in for the next link in the process. So our website would start by putting a message in the queue to suggest we have a new order. The verify process would take that message, once it's completed its job, put it into the validated queue, allowing shipment process work to take care of. It puts a message in the ship queue to allow the notify process to eventually pull the message and send a message back to, send some sort of information back to the client that we've completed their order and it's on its way. So now each of the verify, ship, and notify processes are a mini process that can complete and succeed or fail independently of each other. So that concludes chapter three. That is exploring Windows Azure storage and in particular looking at Windows Azure storage queues. At this point, we'd like to encourage you to go out and take a look at exercise three of the Exploring Windows Azure Storage Lab. You'll find that in the labs folder of the Windows Azure Platform Kit. The lab will take you about 30 minutes. Again, don't forget, run the Visual Studio as administrator in order to be able to launch the dev fabric. And if you're using Visual Studio 2010, make sure your target framework is 3.5 and not .NET 4.0. Good luck, and we'll see you in the next chapter. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led .NET, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.